So uh, today's topic is Green's Law, and um, this is uh, a sound change law. It explains a lot of things that we sometimes might otherwise be kind of like wondering why there are these systematic differences. Um, what happened, uh, we, we've been talking about Indo-European and how Indo-European split into these 10 different uh, branches of which English belongs to which one? Germanic. So English is a Germanic language. Within the Germanic languages, English is a West Germanic language, together with Dutch and German. And uh, what uh, examples could you give of North Germanic languages? Norwegian. Norwegian. What else? The Scandinavian languages, minus Finnish, of course. So, uh, so it would be Norwegian and Swedish, Icelandic, Danish, and Faroese. If you haven't heard of Faroese, that's the language spoken on the, the Faroe Islands that are on the way from Norway, Norway to Iceland. So little uh, islands there on the way, and they have their own language. It's not a very large language, but still, it's a North Germanic um, language also. Uh, then we have East Germanic languages, but what happened to them? Like Gothic no, and no, no. Bur Bur Burgundian, <laughs> they died. So languages can die, they can disappear. When the last speaker of that language dies, then that language is gone. So the language becomes becomes extinct. So, uh, so the Germanic group divides to these three, uh, like roughly geographically determined groups. So, North um, Germanic, like the Scandinavian languages, uh, East Germanic, which are now gone. But you know, Gothic. There's something, something kind of like fascinating to the idea that there was a language called Gothic that was spoken by the Goths. So, um, Burgundian, and, and there were uh, other uh, East Germanic languages. So, East Germanic languages no longer exist, except in some texts in, in Gothic. And then we have the West Germanic languages, like English, Dutch, um, German, Yiddish, which is closely related to, uh, to German. Um, Afrikaans also uh, is closely related to Dutch. The closest relative within, you know, within the Germanic, uh, West Germanic group of languages uh, to English is Frisian, which is spoken on Friesland, which is on the coast of like Holland, on the coast of the Netherlands. And, and uh, that is very, very similar to to English, and if you you know think of the geographic difference, it's not very long. You just have to cross the you know part of the sea in order to uh, reach the place where Frisian is spoken, and, and uh, that would be the closest relative to English. Sometimes English and Frisian are lumped together as Anglo-Frisian languages, but uh, so this is the this is the Germanic group of languages that English belongs to. It's one of those Indo-European branches. And um, when languages uh, move away from each other, they tend to start to develop uh, and go into their own, own direction in a way. Uh, so today, when we talk about Grimm's Law, Grimm's Law, law ex uh, explains some of the sound changes that happened from Indo-European to Germanic. When Germanic uh, split away from Indo-European, of course, it happened gradually but, uh, and over centuries, but, but uh, we're going to be looking at the kinds of differences that we see in Germanic, uh, how Germanic is different from other languages. But before we do that, we need to know what, uh, what Germanic changed from. So what, what first was there in Indo-European? Of course, no texts uh, 
are available. So this has all been based on um, linguistic evidence, uh, historical linguistic, uh, comparative linguistic evidence. So, uh, so historical linguists, they have just you know, compared a lot of languages to each other and see, l looking for patterns and systematic differences from one group to another. And then uh, they have reconstructed uh, these Indo-European roots uh, from which, you know, then, you know, all the different, 10 different bra branches went to 10 different directions and, and underwent uh, 10 different kinds of changes. And we'll be looking at what kinds of changes uh, Germanic um, underwent. So uh, let's talk a little bit about Indo-European phonology first, so we can kind of see what we start from, uh, what we know about Indo-European Indo phonology based on historical comparative data. So uh, common Indo-European, uh, when was that roughly spoken? When, when we looked at that, you know, map where, where Indo-European was somewhere there on the Russian steppes between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, a little bit north, uh, north from that area. That's the hypothesized homeland for Indo-European. And when were they together? 4,000 BC? Yeah, about um, fifth century, um, still like 3,000 before Common Era, the Indo-Europeans are still kind of hypothesized to have been there. They started moving at different times. But in any case, we're talking about thousands of years, about 5,000, 6,000 years back from today. So uh, in Common Indo-European, it had an accent that was based on pitch differences. Pitch, the uh, frequency of the vibration of the vocal cords, and uh, so basically, you know, we, we talk about uh, stress here, and um, that stress could occur in any syllable in Indo-European. How do we know that? We know it because uh, Indo-European languages, they exhibit this same feature still, that you find uh, words that, uh, that have stress on not on always on the first syllable or always on the second or always on the last syllable, but the stress in different words falls on different places. A quick example, which we just used in the previous class also, photograph, stress on the first syllable. Photography, stress on the second syllable. Photographic, the adjective, stress on the third syllable. So we have three different words which are obviously related to each other, meaning, meaning wise, about three different words uh, anyway, and the stress goes photograph, photography, photographic, from the different places. So it's, it, it's not predictable. That, by the way, for non-native speakers of English also, and any language that uses this variable stress, it's a little bit of a challenge because you have to hear the word used uh, before you can kind of, you look at it in writing and it's kind of like, how do I pronounce photographer, for instance? Why is it not photographer <laughs> or photographer? So, um, so uh, that's uh, what we still have from Indo-European. Now, what happened in Germanic? In all these languages that are related to each other more closely, um, like English and German and Swedish and, and uh, Icelandic, uh, in Germanic languages, the, uh, the, the stress, it moved from this variable placement on second or third or fourth syllable even in the, in the words. It moved to the beginning of the word in Germanic. So if you look at in the English word stock that is old, that is uh, native, that is Anglo-Saxon, and we'll see how those words look like. They tend to be shorter words. And uh, in, in those words, the stress is on the first uh, root syllable. If there's a prefix in a word, then the stress is not on the prefix in, in English typically. Uh, but it's um, 
sometimes it is. Uh, but, uh, but the first root syllable in Germanic languages, it took the, took the stress. So there, there was that kind of a uh, change. And in common Germanic, uh, that was then spoken later, uh, at the point when it developed around the you know, beginning of our common era, the uh, strong stress accent, uh, it started to be based on loudness rather than, than pitch. And the stress accent went on the initial syllable, mostly, mostly. So um, what this meant in Germanic as opposed to Indo-European, it meant that there were these changes in phonology because when the stress goes to the first syllable, then it tends to mean that that first syllable in the beginning of the word, it's, it's, it, it's more, more salient. Uh, I don't want to say more audible, but more salient somehow where the stress is, it's very salient. And that led to changes in morphology uh, because uh, Indo-European had very rich, it was a rich, uh, li richly inflectional language. It had several different nominal cases and verbal inflections as well. So uh, Indo-European did a lot of things using inflections at the ends of the words. And now you have the, the, have the stress uh, in Germanic, uh, you have the stress in the beginning of the word so you can't really so saliently notice what hap what is happening there at the ends of the word words. So the ends didn't they kind of lost their importance a little bit in Germanic already. This is a gradual, gradual process that has been going on over a millennia and at least centuries. So in present day English we we have lost most of the inflections that even old English had. And old English had fewer inflections than Germanic had, and Germanic had fewer inflections than Indo-European had. So there's been this loss of inflections. And this leads to changes, ultimately leads to changes in syntax, because when the inflectional endings are not telling who is doing what to whom, uh, then you have to use something else, the syntax, the word order, uh, to indicate who is the subject. Who is the, the object? What is the subject? What is the object in the sentence? And earlier that was indicated, uh, even in Old English, to some degree still uh, with the inflectional endings. But now inflectional endings don't have as much salience because the stress is on the, on the beginning syllable in Germanic as opposed to Indo-European. And, and it kind of like led to this snowballing effect in, in various areas of language. Uh, and that is, in a way, that's kind of, you know, the big picture that uh, several different times when we look at the change that has happened from Old English to present day English, for instance, we see the same trend continue, that there are fewer and fewer inflections. Today, how many of you use the word whom regularly instead of who? Yes, you're an English major, right? <laughs> so, so we tend to use it because we know when whom, uh, with the end there at the end, is supposed to be used. That's still an inflectional ending. It indicates the object case. And, um, and that is, it's going out of commission. You know, uh, you, you find whom uh, less and less uh, frequently in uh, the speed of, uh, speech of, the, of the, the everyday person. And even I had a graduate student who did, uh, did a thesis on the uh, gradual disappearance of whom, uh, took his data from the Houston Chronicle and noticed that uh, even people who are professional writers, they sometimes make mistakes in when to use whom and when to use who. And once you get to that kind of point, you know that, hey, this is an endangered, uh, endangered uh, in inflection because people don't know how to, how to use it. Well, anyway, so that's, uh, that was a little bit of the background, the, the bigger picture. But then um, people have been able to figure out what consonants in the European use. Now we're talking about five, five 6,000 years ago. What were the consonants that Indo-European used? And uh, Indo-European had a set of stops, a voiceless stops, 
p, t, k, and qu. Uh, that uh, we still have the sound like in the beginning of the word queen, queen, p, qu. So that's, uh, that goes back to, uh, that sound goes back to Indo-European. They had, uh, Indo-European had voiced stops and we'll have these all on the board. B, d, g, and w. And voiced aspirated stops, which are foreign to us because they were lost and that's part of the, the law, uh, Grimm's law that we'll be looking at. These were like b, D, G, and G, um, not uh, pronounced with the proper Indo-European accent, I apologize. Indo-European had the fricative S, and the resonance, which we all still have, M, N, O, R, Y, W, there's resonance or sonorance. So the nasals m and n and o and r, the liquids and glides y and w. So uh, very much was very similar. Indo-European uh, is also hypothesized to have had laryngeal consonants that were produced. English doesn't have that place of articulation in the larynx here at the back of the throat. Um, but we know that Indo-European must have had them because there are several Indo-European languages today that still have those. So that's one of those uh, ways to hypothesize of what um, what may have been earlier if there there are surviving sounds that are still used today in some Indo-European languages. Okay, so um, let's uh, look at uh, some data here. So what I've, what I've done, I started filling this out, but I want you to help me uh, add here. So uh, we've got uh, two, basically two segments here. If I can fit myself. So we've got uh, a Germanic example of Germanic. We'll be filling out the English words there. But uh, here we have Latin, French, and Spanish. And we'll look at these words. Uh, Latin, French, and Spanish, they are Italic languages or Romance languages. By the way, not Romantic. Some of you suggested Romantic in the homework assignment. Um, romantic is a different thing from Romance. So, uh, just a uh, just a quick uh, point here. Italic uh, Romance languages such as Latin, French, and Spanish. So, in Latin, uh, the word piscis. What does that mean? Fish. Yes. So in English we have fish and um, hello and uh, uh, th then tres would be a number three and then um, call body part. Heart, yes. And let's fill in French and Spanish here. Also, for fish, uh, the French word is poisson. Mm -hmm. And in Spanish, yes. Right. Pescado. So sometimes, right? Okay, so uh, French for three. Toi. Spanish. Tres. And a uh, heart in French, anyone? And in Spanish, of course, you can't hear uh, a Spanish song without this word. Corazón. Yeah, when I was in grad school I, in the Los Angeles area, I had to drive a lot, like uh, an hour uh, drive 
usually two, three hours. So I thought, I'm going to learn Spanish. And I'll just listen to the you know, Spanish channel and you know, the music. And, and I did learn Corazon. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so we've got fish, three, and heart. Now, what are we noticing here? In all the uh, Romance languages, Italic languages, when there is a P, what do we have in English instead? P, 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 but, and uh, when Latin, French, and Spanish have a T, what does the English have? English has <laughs> right. So, uh, so this is an F. The letter is the same. So. Here we have the internetal fricative. And when Italic languages have k, like in cor and cur and corazon, what does English have? So here we have Italic. And in the Europe, both are in the European languages. Here, an example from a Germanic language. Both are in the both groups are in the European, obviously. But something happened when uh, Germanic split from Indo-European. Uh, sound changes happened. So, um, so uh, the uh, p. The voiced, I mean voiceless, voiceless um, bilabial stop, p, became a labial dental voiceless fricative. Note that the mm, approximate place of articulation is still the same. So p and f they are both labial. So B is bilabial, this is labial dental. But they are basically, this is what is referred to as home organic place of articulation. It's approximately the same, not identical, but still in the front of the mouth, in the lips area. Uh, the voicelessness feature did not change. So B is voiceless and so is F but the manner of articulation changed from a stop b to a fricative in Germanic, in Germanic languages. If you know another Germanic language, you'll find that, like in German, father for father, and fisk in Swedish for fish. So uh, same thing here. When uh, Romance languages have t, an alveolar stop voiceless in Germanic, it became a voiceless uh, interdental fricative. You still have, and you, you read in your book that um, very often the dental alveolar, those regions, they're still in the front of the mouth. So um, t became not far away in terms of the place of articulation, no change at all in terms of voicing, both are voiceless, but the manner changed from a stop to a fricative. Same thing with k becoming Now we are not talking about the front of the mouth as the place of articulation, now we are there at the back region, so k, a velar became a uh, glottal, you know, back, back place of articulation. And uh, what your book gives here about Grimm's Law, this is Grimm's Law, changes of the Indo-European stops uh, into Germanic, how they changed. So <coughs> your book gives a, a friendly uh, <coughs> approach or account of that, so it's uh, 
not too convoluted sometimes uh, Grimm's law is uh, identified as the nightmare of the student of the history of English but but this the book gives a very good uh, account still of the of the important changes there they are skipping some they are skipping some intermediate stages but uh, that's just well, we take this in uh, at the graduate level and we'll elaborate anyway so so what we have here is the in the European stop system so in the European had these three sets of stops it had p, t, t, the voiceless stops, corresponding voiced stops, b, d, g, and what looks more foreign to us, the corresponding voiced aspirated stops, b, d, g. If you look at Hindi, uh, for instance, um, uh, Indian uh, people's last names, for instance, you can see often that, that you know this combination, the, the, uh, those would appear there, and um, and that is because those are Indo-European languages, and they have some languages have retained that feature. Okay, but um, but let's see what happened from Indo-European. To Germanic, so uh, this is uh, the first change that happened in Germanic, only in Germanic, not in any other Indo-European languages. The p, t, k pronunciations changed to fricatives. Uh, roughly homoorganic, the same place, similar place of articulation. Uh, the same uh, voicing, voicing did not change, but they became um, and 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 here we have more examples of that. So. Um, draw a line here. So um, English words, so this is an example of Germanic, how they changed. And here we have Latin, which is Indo-European also, but the Romance branch. And these are reconstructed Indo-European roots for that same word. Um, when there's a little asterisk in historical linguistics, when you have an asterisk in front of a word or a root, it means that it has been reconstructed by you know, historical linguists comparing tons and tons of data. So these would be the Indo-European roots. And these are also Indo-European, they are uh, Latin. So, uh, pater in Indo-European, in Latin it's pater, no change really at all. Uh, in Germanic, the p changes into an f. In Germanic. The Indo-European root for fish was fisk. Uh, Latin retains that we have fish. And um, the word for, uh, the root for foot in Indo-European, bed, and Latin retains that, but uh, Germanic changed it to F. Okay, so um, now, uh, t, these are examples of T changing, the Indo-European T. Uh, the alveolar, voiceless alveolar stop changing into voiceless, uh, roughly homoorganic interdental 
um, uh, fricative. So, t changed into. So, tres, tres in Latin, uh, three in English. Ten, tenuous, became thin in English. And the word for you, singular, tu, uh, in Latin, uh, Latin retained it. And in Old English, you find it. Uh, the uh, thaw, <laughs> this is the thorn, and uh, that uh, stands for the interdental fricative. And it was pronounced in Old English, it was still pronounced as voiceless thaw. So in the European th changed, in Germanic it changed into th. And the same thing happened with k. which changed into, so uh, the word horn uh, has k in, in, uh, in the European root was k, Latin retains it and you can see that in other Romance languages the k. Uh, heart uh, in the European was kerd and Hundred, the beginning part of the word hundred was kmtom, uh, nice consonant clusters there. Uh, in the European, had a lot of these syllabic, syllabic uh, consonants. Um, Latin retains the k because it's not Germanic, so you have kent, and um, and we have the h. So these are just, you know, more of the same kind of examples as what we looked, looked at there. So this is the first change in the Grimm's law. Um, p t k became uh, f, f. And we can make a generalization. This is not just that, you know, you don't have to, have to uh, think that how am I going to remember these changes. Uh, these changes are not completely random. We can characterize the change so that voiceless stops change into voiceless homorganic, pretty much the same uh, place of articulation, not identical, but pretty much the same. Uh, fricatives. All right. So uh, what we have after this change has happened, we have a situation where in in Germanic, there are no So what's going to happen next is this snowballing chain reaction that b, d, g go ahead and take the place of p, t, k. So these change to note that you know we. That this change cannot happen before this change has finished happening. So uh, otherwise it would be confusing. But after, after p, t, k had become f, f, then b, d, g can take their place. Does that make sense? And uh, I have some examples uh, of these, I might actually send these over um, so you don't have to, you know, write everything down. But, um, but uh, we have some examples from, uh, from Indo-European languages, other Indo-European languages, uh, where we can see these changes. So let's see if we have time to do that. But uh, let me wrap, the, wrap this up first. And uh, what happened after this change had uh, finished happening, you can already guess. Now we don't have Bechdeke in Germanic because Bechdeke became Bechdeke. Let's uh, try to describe, by the way, before I erase it, Bechdeke. How would you generalize this change? Bechdeke. How would you characterize those three sounds? They are voiced, 
stops, right? So voice stops became voiceless. Voiceless? Yes. They became voiceless. They just lost the voice. Voicing, the vibration of the vocal cords. The the k became k. Okay. So those no longer exist. So what do you think happens next? How are these guys going to change? They lose the aspiration. So they take the place of the so to say. Because there are no the anymore. So the the g lose the aspiration and become the the g, which earlier had become the which earlier had become so this is in a nutshell this is Grimm's law Jakob Grimm of course uh, with his brother Wilhelm they became uh, later famous for um, the fairy tales the very grim, grim fairy tales where all kinds of horrible things happen and little children need to learn about the danger of this world so um, Anyway, those are the same. Those are the same brothers, Jakob Grimm. They were they were uh, folklorists uh, uh, and historical linguists, philologists, uh, and uh, and Jakob Grimm formulated this law, even though there had been uh, people who had al already kind of looked into that. He wasn't necessarily the first one to do it, but as your book points out um, in in his in history, some person's name gets attached to, to uh, important things that ha happened. And <clears throat> what is really neat about uh, Grimm's law is that, uh, it, it is that it explains this. You look at another Indo-European language like Spanish or French or Russian or Greek or Latin or what have you, and you see that, wow, uh, this word looks and sounds very much the same, but it's not identical. And now you have the tool to understand why we find p in, uh, in Romance languages, for instance, and t and k when the corresponding sounds in English are This was an extremely, uh, extremely uh, regular change that uh, and and I'll I'll post uh, ex uh, exercises for you later on uh, about this because it's easiest to to understand it when you do exercises and also do all the exercises in your book but uh, basically it's it was like every time you find an uh, in English it's it it is in other um, like for instance, in other Indo-European languages. The change happened only in Germanic, okay. Now, uh, the question is, a quick question, why do we have, this is uh, after, after the change, but we also have the word unicorn and cornucopia like abundance of all the good things, but why don't we have unique unihorns? I mean, that's what it means, this mythical animal. Why don't we call that mythical animal a unihorn? Because you borrowed over to a piece We borrowed this word later. It was a later, later borrowing. Uh, same thing uh, we have. Uh, Foot, but um, what do you call a doctor who uh, takes care of feet? Podiatrist. Podiatrist, right? Uh, we have these kinds of pairs like teeth, but then dental. Again, this is a later borrowing from a non-Germanic Indo-European language. 
which had that the, and of course when we borrowed it, Grimm's law did not apply anymore, so we end up with these kind of like doublets of words. Uh, we have also mother, but maternal, and so on. So, um, so this is, um, this is what happened, and that's Grimm's law extremely mechanical. You can mechanically apply it, except when Werner's law applies. So this is the exception to, to Grimm's law, uh, Werner's law. Uh, Karl Werner uh, was a, um, was a, um, another philologist, philologist who people had, no, had started to notice that, wow, this Grimm's law, the, these sound changes, they are really, really mechanical. They seem to apply throughout. However, um, there are uh, very, some very, very few exceptions to it, and people couldn't figure out what in the world was going on. And uh, then Werner came and formulated his own own uh, law. So let's look at, uh, we have the word pater here. And uh, so far we've been looking at the p changing into, that's the regular change. But what was the t supposed to be? according to Grimm's law. Or the theta. Yes. But do we say father? We say father. So in this case, to did not follow. This would be would have been the regular mechanical Grimm's law. So is this Grimm? But we don't find that happening here because we do not say father. The became it became the voiced fricative. And this was a little bit complicated to figure out because there was a stress shift uh, from Indo-European to Germanic that kind of disguised what was going on. So this was supposed to become, but it became and it became in an environment where it's in a voiced environment. So you find Werner's law basically applying in the middle of the word where it's where uh, where a uh, sound that should have been you know following Grimm's law uh, did not and and it's the environment voiced environment that uh, that led to this uh, to this uh, exception to Grimm's law so that um, so that in a word like far fur the didn't it didn't stay or it didn't become uh, the voice less fricative like it was supposed to. It became uh, it, it didn't become voiceless. It it became voice, and this is a kind of uh, voicing assimilation that when you have when you have your vocal cords vibrating for the ah uh, the vowel sound here and then you have to stop, you would have to stop the vocal cords from vibrating uh, for the voiceless. And then you would have to make them vibrate again for the following vowel. That's a lot of work. So uh, sometimes our pronunciations, our laziness in pronunciations, they lead to sound changes so that uh, you just let the vocal cords vibrate throughout here and that's why what was supposed to be, according to Grimm, a voiceless fricative, it became a voiced fricative. Does that make sense? 
So farther you let the vocal cords vibrate throughout, starting from here, okay? But uh, I mentioned this did not happen um, in all environments, you have to also have a, st a stress shift. So in Indo-European, the stress was on the following syllable. So uh, it was pater, pater, and uh, that stress uh, shifted then here. We don't say father, uh, it's father. So the stress in Germanic, because as I mentioned in the beginning of the class, the stress in Germanic, it tended to move to the first uh, root syllable of the word. So that shift happened. And that uh, w went together with Vernon's law. So Vernon's law explains an exception. To Grimm's law. And uh, here's a useful thing probably to know as a last tidbit of this class of Grimm and Werner. I don't think your book much elaborates on this, but, uh, but you deserve to know. In case anyone was ever wondering why we say was with an s and where with an er, uh, Werner's law explains that as well. So, uh, so s became er in a voiced environment when, when the stress had shifted to the first syllable. So, um, uh, S is not part of the part of the uh, these these uh, Indo-European consonants that shifted very very regularly and under Grimm, but it's uh, added into Vermeer's law. Okay, so I will be sending you more stuff uh, on Blackboard, and uh, thank you for listening and enjoy reading and doing exercises on this, then later on I'll, I'll post and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.